So welcome everybody um, to the combined chapters meeting today. Your host will be Mara Belau. If you don't already know who she is, she's one of our board, board of um, directors and one of our most active members. And it was actually her idea to do this combined um, meeting, which will then be uh, translated into Portuguese for uh, further work on the Portuguese and I, possibly also in Spanish from our um, Mexican chapter. Uh, so we welcome you all. And this is really important information that I think we're all going to use for a long time still, unfortunately. So I, I'm, I'll let her further introduce. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are all over the world. I'm very pleased to be here. I would like to acknowledge all the efforts of Ms. Maria Russo, who is our executive director at the Voice Foundation. She always do great any time of the day. She's always there to protect the voice of the members, to direct us, to guide, and to outreach. And on behalf of the Voice Foundation and Professor Satiloff, I would like to welcome you all. This is a very special session sponsored by the Voice Foundation and the National Association of Teachers of Singing, NATS, is one of the most important partners of the Voice Foundation. I see us like twins with different competences, different e expertise, but a combined interest and the same goal, to have a, good, a better voice and to spread the word. I'm very pleased because today we have three special experts that are going to guide us and they are going to power up our practice. And this is what we want the most, to offer the best service to our clients. I have the pleasure to introduce Alan Henderson, Joshua Glasner, and Nicholas Perna. And uh, the first one speaker is Alan Anderson, and he is executive director of the NATS, which is the most important association of voice teachers. And he is an amazing person, and he's going to start the session. And then we are going to have Joshua, that is professor of music at Clark University. And we are going to have Nicholas Perma, who is associate professor in the Mississippi College. And they are all very active in Journal of Singing, Journal of Voice too. So if you are from the voice area and you only know Journal of Voice, you should know also Journal of Singing because Journal of Singing has the unique strategy of placing the most difficult information in the area in a language that the average SLP can understand and can feel better about exchanging ideas and information with this wonderful experts in singing. So Dr. Alan Henderson, the word is with you. As you know, the session is going to be summarized and translated into Brazilian Portuguese. And we have a special session tomorrow on this session. And Thais Vaiano, who is present, and Elizabeth Amin, also present, are going to be our reporters of the session. And I hope that Dr. Manzano, a phoniatrician, who is also present in the session, and he represents Mexico, is going to make a summary for the Spanish community. So I feel very privileged to, at this afternoon, Sunday afternoon, because I know that we can do this because of the pandemic. So there is a good side on that. 
we were not going to be able to put all these people together in a nice conversation if, we, if it was not this very sad and difficult situation. So thank you for your generosity. And Dr. Henderson, it's with you now. Thank you so much, Mara, for that introduction. And thank you, Maria, for all of your hard work on behalf of the Voice Foundation. Uh, Nats is a, a privilege to be a, a great partner with the Voice Foundation in a whole host of ways. And uh, it's just a really important partnership that we have. And I want to welcome you to this session and say Happy Father's Day to those in Brazil today. I know it's an important day in Brazil. So uh, Happy Father's Day to you and your families. And uh, we want to have a conversation this afternoon uh, and bring to you some tools, hopefully, that will help you in your practice and your singing uh, practice or your clinic practice. Uh, we, we hope that you will uh, feel free to put questions in the chat box. We'll have some other time, hopefully later, for some open mic questions as well. Uh, so just feel free to uh, pepper those in as, as they come to you and we'll try to address them along the way. Uh, Joshua and Nick are my partners in crime, and uh, they, they're a, a great folks. They're deep into this technology stuff. Uh, they understand all the acoustics and all the science talk about it as well. And I'm here to like say, wait a minute, when they get a little bit too deep, uh, they kind of go down for a dive and sometimes they don't come up for a while. So uh, I will interject where I think we might need a little clarification here and there and uh, also try to bring in some of your questions as we talk about uh, this important topic. We've spent uh, you know, several months now in uh, dealing with this pandemic since uh, certainly mid-March in the United States when things began truly uh, basically shutting down and moving online to instruction. And uh, we've been helping a lot of, of teachers move to online instruction. Uh, and we call it, we just kind of did triage over the spring uh, and until school was out. And then uh, folks like Josh and Nicholas and other many others have been kind of continuing the work and continuing to refine the ways in which we can improve our opportunities to connect uh, with our students and our, our folks in our clinic and still do the work that we want to do in the, in the best quality way. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Joshua and Nick to get started. And here we go. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Maria, for having us. Um, this is truly an exciting thing for us. I don't think I've ever done anything that's been translated into anything, let alone um, Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, so this is su super, super exciting. Uh, we have been at this work for a, a good long time, as Alan just said. And, um, you know, Josh uh, and I are, are very fortunate that we've got a really great team of people around us, and I'm going to tell you about them in a minute. But None of this work is, is just a result of anything that we've come to or, or anything like that. Um, so let me share my screen and we'll, and we'll dive in. Make sure that's that way and we'll go there. All right. Well, maybe. There we go. Um, I, so powering up your practice, if you're not familiar with uh, Super Mario Brothers, the little mushroom, you eat the little mushroom and, and, and you grow on, in Super Mario Brothers or any other Mario uh, version for that matter. Uh, anyway, um, so thank you, Josh, for giving us that reference. Um, not, not mine. That was totally Josh. All right. So here's our big our plan. We're going to talk about the big picture. Uh, we're going to talk about connection type platforms. Um, basically internet platforms, so like websites that will help you with your audio or, or latency, depending on what, what we're doing. Uh, we'll talk about um, equipment, and, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll wrap. Really, you can think of it this way. You're, you, we're going we're gonna to cover connection with Ethernet. We're going to cover <laughs> audio fidelity and, and latency, and then we're going to cover technology. That's basically the plan. 
Um, this is the, you'll have to forgive us. This is, this is my third time doing this. Josh and Alan and I did this at Nats, and then I actually did this basically same presentation yesterday too. So we're getting a little bit better at it. Of course, when you do something over and over again, sometimes you start leaving stuff out. So if I leave something out, guys, please just interrupt me and, and we can go backwards. The first thing we want to say is that things are going to change. The, the difficult part when you're dealing with technology, particularly in a time of crisis, and in times of crisis, the world tends to change very rapidly. I mean, if we go back to March, most singing practitioners, speech language pathologists, anybody who was dealing with voice, the very first way you interacted was in the air in a room. And you dealt with the vibrations that were being created by that human across from you in a room. And then the air became poisonous, <laughs> essentially. Um, and, and, but anyway, this technology stuff, as it has adapted, it continues to be refined, it's going to continue to evolve. So we sort of have to plug in and be lifelong learners with technology because it's going to keep changing. Um, we have been really specifically working on enabling music making to be possible. Now, that might not need to be a part of what, what you're doing uh, if you're not necessarily teaching singing lessons, but, but a lot of our... our, a lot of our a lot of the ideals that we'll cover will be applicable to anybody who is in the realm of voice. We're trying to help folks make informed decisions. And we say that because I don't think there is a one size fits all with this stuff that if we just say, do this, this, use this, that won't work because all of our practice is a little bit different. Uh, and, and I even mean that like within the, within the sub-discipline of just voice teachers. Not every voice teacher's practice is exactly the same. We want to be very clear that any of the companies, any company, any platform, any technology, anything we reference, we have no financial interest in any of these. And we've been really tried to make that clear every time we've done this, um, that, that we are not in this to make a buck. Um, we are just um, here to help 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 people the best we can. Josh and I want to give special thanks to our team. We were very fortunate that um, thanks to our team leader Ian Howell at New England Conservatory and his assistant Kayla Godero, and then Josh and myself and Chadley Ballantyne, who's at Stetson, we were already engaged in daily conversations and on you and when. When I say daily conversations, up until March the 7th, those daily conversations were about usually voice acoustics or voice aerodynamics, maybe voice teaching. Then, all of a sudden, on March the 7th, for about three weeks, all of our conversations came, came to become about what in the world uh, Zoom, Apple FaceTime, Voice Lessons app, and um, Skype or Microsoft Teams do to audio as they process the audio. And after we sort of then put out that preliminary report, we got a little bit busy with the rest of the semester, but then really turned our attention to our other focuses, which were high fidelity audio, how can we hear a singer as if they were in the room with us over the internet, and then eventually dealing with the problem of latency. Um, so we want to give big time props to them uh, because, like I said, Josh and I didn't come to any of this on our own. One of the difficulties with some of these solutions is that things sometimes cost money and maybe you can throw a bunch of money at a problem and it will save you time. Sometimes things don't need to cost money at all, but you might have to invest a little bit of time in helping yourself with that. And I do think that a lot of these technological solutions that we're going to talk about today fit into this framework um, because most of them, one of the primary ones that we've been using is a platform called Soundjack, which I'll talk about later, but it's free. It, takes a little, bit, a little bit of time to get to get to know okay so let's talk about um connection our first big picture idea big picture idea number one please 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 use ethernet 
if you oh whoa if you are still trying to do whatever you're doing online and you're trying to do it over Wi-Fi, um, we are begging you, ether an Ethernet cable is the cheapest solution out there. It's that you actually need to buy. It's ten to twenty dollars, maybe thirty dollars US. I'm talking. Um, it's not an expensive piece of technology. You can get yourself an Ethernet cable for, you know, a minimal amount of money, and that alone will give you the connection stability that you'll stop having these dropouts where all, uh, uh, so, um, um, uh, and and we've all experienced that over some of these meetings. So get yourself an Ethernet cable. If you have a router, if you have home internet, you have the ability to plug in an Ethernet cable. They don't make routers without Ethernet ports, um, at least not that I've ever seen. So get yourself an Ethernet cable. That is problem solved very cheaply, problem one. Now, let's talk about Internet-based platforms, okay? There are platforms over the Internet that people have been using to help their practice or their teaching whatever some are asynchronous some are synchronous meaning we're able to interact but they're not synchronous enough that there's not pretty significant lag or latency and then there are ones that are synchronous and nearly lagless meaning they up uh, that their that third category would be more in real time um and we're going to talk, I'm going to give you a little chart that Josh made that, that, that goes through each of these right here. So some asynchronous solutions that some people are using in their teaching or their practice. Canvas and Blackboard are two like university apps um, that you can load all your course materials onto, things of this nature. And students and faculty can interact, but it's the faculty member posts a video, the student posts a response it doesn't it's not engaging like on zoom there's no you know there's no any kind of actual synchronous um back and forth at all I know that um and again i can't claim that this app works nationally i think it probably is but i, I know some voice teachers um who uh are using the marco polo app basically to say like the student Marco Polo is sort of like text messaging except it's text messaging through video and so like the student records a little video and just sends it through Marco Polo and the voice teacher sends a little video reply back that would be an example of a, an asynchronous solution that might be helpful to some people but most of what we're going to talk about today are not that most of what we're going to talk about are laggy synchronous, which is what we're on right now on Zoom. And then we're going to talk about some nearly lag as well. Um, so Zoom, like I said, is an example of laggy synchronous. So we're able to interact, but the way these work is my video signal gets sent through the Internet and goes to a centralized server your signal gets sent through the internet and gets to a synchronized server and then zoom mixes those together at the server and then sends them back out that time it takes to go to that server and come back creates higher latency and so if you were trying for example musicians the musician problem is if you're trying to go ba 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 together at the same time, and you're trying to play it on the piano, can't do that with your student on a live platform like Zoom. Now, one of the things about some of these platforms is also that like Zoom does not have great audio quality in general. So we're gonna talk about some other solutions like CleanFeed and Source Connect that actually do give you better quality audio. So we're gonna talk about a few of these. In fact, these are the ones we're going to highlight. We're going to highlight Clean Feed. We're going to highlight Source Connect Now, both of which are high fidelity, audio only platforms. Okay? 
I can mention Internet MIDI a little bit as well. Um, it is specifically for keyboard and sending a digital keyboard signal, which could allow you to play for a student. It's a little bit of a novel solution. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about SoundJack. Um, I could talk to you about SoundJack for the next six hours probably because um, that's the program that we have at, at my university that we've decided to go with and, and what most of our team has decided to go with in terms of being able to make actual real-time music together. Okay, so let's go on from there. So, as we think back, you know, to March, the question is, you know, the problems that we, that we ran into, and, you know, do we really need to change? Um, that, that's the first question, you know, because maybe you sort of figured out Zoom, oh, whoops, maybe you sort of figured out Zoom and you're happy with Zoom. Okay, okay, there might be, we might be able to offer you something better, but okay, cool. Um, but you have to ask yourselves, like what we in the singing world have been dealing with, we have to ask ourselves, can you hear soprano high notes clearly? Or is the mic cutting out? Can you actually hear someone do a messa di voce? Can you hear coloratura cleanly? These were all problems that I was running into on Zoom that I was frustrated by. Um, the reality is we can actually have stable, high fidelity audio and nearly real-time synchronicity right now without spending a whole lot of money. And that's the good news. So two of the laggy solutions we're gonna talk about are Clean Feed and Source Connect Now. Both of these are audio only platforms. So think of it in a way like a phone call. Um, and actually, I was just referencing this yesterday. If you go back, I mean, over the history of singing teaching remotely, uh, the f telephone was, of course, the first way this ever happened. If you go on to YouTube, there is a great video of, it's just audio, but it's a video, of Michael Jackson having a voice lesson with Seth Riggs over the telephone. It's a great video, and it's a fine lesson. Um, anyway, so just doing an audio-only solution is not old, but you can combine this with a video call, whatever your favorite video platform would be. Say you love Zoom, you Zoom, mute video, and connect a clean feed call. Clean feed is free for the regular um, version. There is a pro version that gives you some more options. And what it's doing is um, Zoom takes your audio and it compresses it way down by putting a high pass filter on it and reduces the bit rate. These solutions are allowing you to raise the bit rate and thereby raising your frequency threshold a whole bunch probably double at least of what Zoom can give you. And the experience is like having cotton removed from your ears and all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, I can hear. Um, we've heard recently some specific problems with clean feed, usually regarding echo. One of the things with any of these solutions, particularly clean Source Connect now, you have to be, both parties have to be on headphones. Because if I had a speaker sitting here and I heard my signal coming back into the speaker, that would give us then echo into the mic. So you need a closed audio loop, which is why everybody needs to be on headphones. But that's great because that way there's no echo cancellation in the algorithm and you can talk over each other, which gets us a step closer to being able to like, you know, play for each other, which is of course 
the, the goal with, with most voice teachers. Clean feed, I, I, I want to say one other thing about this because we have an international audience. I tried, I can't speak to its connectivity in every country. Um, I tried a call, clean feed call very recently in the last two weeks to Hong Kong and it would not go through, but I have a feeling that was due to governmental restrictions that had been recently been put in place on their internet with everything that's going on in Hong Kong right now. Um, Source Connect Now, the problems with it, I actually love Source Connect Now, but it only works if you're on a computer. It will not work on any mobile device. Clean Feed works great on mobile devices. The only thing is if you are trying to originate a clean feed call, you can't do that from an i or an iPhone. It it will not it, iOS cannot generate the call. It can receive the call, but it can't make the call. Um so anyway, these are solutions for high fidelity laggy audio. Internet MIDI is, is a different kind of novel product. Um, it, it does uh, require a subscription. Um, I think it's a one-time purchase. Um, it will work on Mac OS or Windows. And what it is, you have to have a digital keyboard and then have that in, connect, connected to your computer through a MIDI controller. And it will send your digital key signal to other person's digital keyboard. So actually in this case, there's the added expense that both parties would need to have this as well. Whereas if, if we're just talking about an audio thing like Source Connect Now or Clean Feed, only you, the clinician or the teacher, even need to have an account, um, let alone a, a subscription if you're going with Clean Feed Pro. Uh, they are, for the student or the, or the, the, the patient or whatever, it, it would be free for them. It's worth switching. This is this is all ignore the well don't ignore the video but this is just Josh with his quarantine beard and his uh and his Jitsi call on the right it's a different video platform like Jitsi is a platform very much like Zoom except it uses some other different things we can talk about in a minute but this is his clean feed um display it is that simple it will just show you your user it will give you an option to generate a link for someone else and what I would say is if you figured out zoom you can way easier figure out clean feed so all you would do is connect to your zoom call mute your zoom call connect to your clean feed call and then voila you can at least have high quality mostly uncompressed audio unlike zoom or worse Microsoft Skype uh, or Apple FaceTime, which are very compressed audio. This is a spectrogram. Um, Josh, you want to jump in and just tell them about the spectrogram? Give me a little break talking. <laughs> sure thing. Um, <clears throat> so the what we did here was actually, this is a uh, originally a recording done by Nick and his wife, I believe, um, first recorded through Soundtrack and then played through um, Zoom. So the one on the bottom uh, is, and then actually also through clean feed. So the one on the bottom is actually rec originally recorded with uh, soundtrack and then played through clean feed. And then the top one is the originally played, uh, recorded with soundtrack and then played through Zoom. And, um, you know, of course, the, the obvious difference here, the, the more obvious difference here is that there's obviously a, there's a frequency, there's a difference in the frequency range of that of both of the platforms um we would probably argue that um that impacts our own practice especially working with singers um, but i would imagine as well that um it would impact one's practice as a clinician um depending on your the depending on your own uh methods or perhaps your uh the paradigm within which you're working yeah yeah i would particularly say what i some of the voice teachers um yesterday was that we know that, uh, particularly now with contemporary singing, um, CCM styles, belt voice, that kind of thing, that there is a ton of, of information, acoustic information, from 7,000 hertz and up. And you can see on Zoom, that's where their audio ends. Whereas 
in clean feed, it more than doubled that. Um, because it opens up the bit rate, which opens up the compression, and all of a sudden, I'm telling you, you will feel like you now can hear your singers again. Um, I would also say, not just contemporary singing, but if you teach any high treble singing, uh, sopranos, it's, it makes a huge difference. And I would also say, Nick, look, if, you were to, if one were to zoom into <laughs> the zoom um, uh, spectrogram, uh, you would probably see um, indicators of compression, whereas clean feed are audio compression, whereas clean feed, um, they're not as present. Correct. Obje yes. uh, subjectively, as you look at the spectrogram. Yes, totally agreed. Cool. Okay, so, so far, let's just, let's just recap where we are right now. So we've talked about connection type, meaning we want to be connected via Ethernet, okay? We've talked, of, oh, well, I'll come back to that. We've, and we've talked about audio fidelity. So we've used platforms that allow us to have uncompressed high fidelity audio. For a lot of folks, those are really the steps that you need. They're really like the two things that really will make a difference in your practice. Now, the other thing we're going to talk about before Josh gets to tech, and Josh is going to tell you about technology, some, some hardware, I would say that you it's even worth the money spending money on things like microphones or, well, yesterday I had an extra audio interface sitting here, or audio interfaces, I realized I put it away, or audio interfaces, or anything of the sort until you've moved to one of these high fidelity audio platforms. Once you've done that, it can be worth investing in audio technology. But honestly, even, I mean, yes, a USB mic or better yet, an actual microphone will give you better audio even on Zoom. Or I wouldn't have wasted the time just having this here today. But, it's like it's not worth the investment until you've moved to one of the other platforms. Okay. So again, we've talked about Ethernet. We've talked about high audio. The third thing we're going to talk about is latency. Now, this really only applies if you are a musician and you really want to be teaching voice or some other type of music, for that matter, at the same time. So you want to be playing rhythmically, singing rhythmically together. You want to accompany your students or vocalize your students. That's where these platforms would come into play. Uh, Soundjack, Jacktrip, Jamulus, and Jamkazam. Let me go backwards in that order. Jamkazam is, is a very much a commercial product. It I think personally, my belief is it overpromises and underperforms. Um, it's a pretty easy initial setup, but to actually dial in the advanced settings, it gets much more complex. Jamulus is an interesting solution, but only if you are on one local area network. Like if all of your users are at a university and they're all on the same network, one person's computer acts as a server and actually sends that server mix back out, um, which is much um, similar to another solution that we had present at Nats National, which was a program called Rehearsal Live Share, um, which is might be a solution. Like if you're trying to produce a, a choir or a musical or something, Rehearsal Live Share might be something worth looking into. Um, but the but the primary two that I've seen people use actually practically in the world, not just in concept, but in the world, are Jack Trip and Sound Jack. Jack Trip is out of the game at Stanford, CCA, and one of the leading um, music technology programs in the United States, certainly. Um, Jack Trip has existed for the better part of two decades, and both of these platforms, Soundjack and Jack, are functioning by DP packets of sound through the internet, and they work peer to peer. So rather than Zoom, which again sends my 
audio and video somewhere, your audio and video somewhere. They get mixed together in the server and sent back out. Jack Trip and Soundjack, the idea is you configure your router to be able to send your signal still through some internet traffic police, but basically right to the, your, like if Josh and I were trying to collaborate, my router would send information straight to his router. That would be the idea, okay? Jack Trip is very stable. It's very complicated. It only works in terminal, and it is, it is complex. It is completely uncompressed audio, so the audio quality is very high, but it will only allow a connection of one party to another party. So that's it. So it could allow like a voice teacher to communicate, but they could add a pianist. So anyway, that's a little bit about Jack. Sound Jack is the platform that we've been using the most and experimenting with the most. And we've been doing so both through the internet remotely, so from like a person's home to a person's home. We've also been doing a lot of experimenting using Soundjack local area network at various universities. I find Soundjack to be honestly pretty user friendly. It looks complex at first, even though it's just one, there's only one screen of Soundjack, it's just a bunch of menus. But to be completely honest, you really only end up changing two of those menus at any given point. And so if you can figure out Zoom, you could figure out Soundjack. Um, we're not going to do a real deep dive on Soundjack today. I can answer questions if you have them about this platform. But, but I, I'm, the question is, is, is it even worth exploring? This is a recording that the... Four, four, excuse me, not the four, four of the New England Conservatory preparatory program jazz faculty recorded all from different locations in the Boston, Massachusetts area. So there were four musicians, not in one place, but around the city over a distance of about 25 miles playing music together on Soundjack. And here's a little example of that. <laughs> Before we move on, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Again, um, Ian Burden of the writing of um, the Soundjack user guide, uh, Ian Howell Countertenor.com. He's got a couple of different articles. Um, if you just click the tab at the top of the page, and and the Soundjack user guide will come up. If you're really interested in possibly using Soundjack, our recommendations are usually go to EU, that's the website, soundjack.eu, watch the tutorial videos, go to Ian's website, read Ian's user guide on Soundjack, download the program, and then if you have problems, then reach out to us. <laughs> and we're here to help. That, that, that's, sort of the, that's sort of what I would say about that. So again, we've covered three issues so far. Internet connection, Ethernet, high fidelity audio, which is clean feed or source connect now. And then we've just been talking about latency platform, which I really only highlighted this one, which is Soundjack. Um, and from there, I'm gonna be quiet for a while and let Josh tell you about equipment stuff. Let me stop my share. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, jump on to the previous slide that was shared. And I, I do want to point out um, one, two things, in fact. The first is that this recording, while it was um, 
you know, in, in real time or quasi real time, there was, I think, a 20 to 30 millisecond delay. Um, you might listen to that and say, wow, that doesn't actually sound that much different than what I typically hear in Zoom other than things being synced up. And I would refer you first to those spectrograms um, because remember, we're taking this thing that was recorded with Soundjack and we're putting it through Zoom, which inherently filters the sound. So if you want to listen to that and some other examples, um, there's that QR code at, the, at, uh, at this screen, uh, on the bottom left corner of the screen. Um, and then also this will show up at the very end. If you want to go and listen to some examples of different types of singing on different platforms or potentially listen to, or, and potentially listen to this um, quartet uh, with its actual um, fidelity of audio or audio fidelity. So as... Thank Nick's, you for saying that. Of course, of course. So as uh, Nick said, I'm going to be talking about equipment because one of the things that we do know about Soundjack and CleanFeed um, is that since they, um, since they put out what we put into it, right? They, they don't ostensibly, they don't filter the sound. Um, we have the potential of essentially, essentially hearing the voices that we work with um, as if they were in the room with us. One of the ways that we um, can make sure that that happens is by optimizing some of the equipment that we have. And I do want to say that while some of this equipment that we're going to talk about um, can actually help you with your own practice, um, it's not uh, in certain situations, not necessarily required. We understand that everybody is in different circumstances right now um, and that we all have to work within uh, within our means and within the structures that are sometimes even dictated to us. Um, so first of all, well, we'll today, I think the important thing to keep in mind with all of this equipment is what's the purpose of what you're, uh, of recording for your practice. For example, for me, I prioritize in my uh, work as a voice teacher, um, I prioritize being able to replicate the face-to-face -face or in the room experience as much as possible. So for me, it's important that my microphone doesn't filter sound. It's important to me that um, if I'm using Soundjack, for example, that I don't, inter I don't add to that signal chain, which we'll talk about in a second. I don't add to that signal chain um, any piece of equipment that will actually increase the amount of time that it takes from my singer's voice to get to my ear or my client's voice to get to my ear. Um, some people will oftentimes ask me, can I get it? Can you recommend to me a microphone that will allow me to have voice lessons, be really great for my, you know, YouTube channel and allow me to, um, also, uh, sing on stage or create a podcast. And the answer is honestly, no. And, and the joke that I like to tell, and that, that might seem harsh, but the joke that I like to tell is you know, I, I'm looking at my kitchen right now and I know that I have an iron skillet and I have a um, non-stick skillet. And I asked one of my students, I said, because he was asking me this question, I said, would you necessarily um, fry, like cook a steak on a non-stick sti uh, skillet? And he said, well, no, of course not. I said, well, what would you use? And he said, well, I'd probably use an iron skillet in order to, to, to uh, cook the steak properly. I said, great. Would you, what would you do if you wanted to um, fry some eggs? And he said, well, I'd probably use the nonstick skillet. And I said, would you use the iron skillet for that purpose? And he said, well, I'd I, I probably wouldn't, but if I, I could, um, I just have to be really good at it. I'd have to use, use the equipment in a, in a very unusual way. Um, and I think this applies to microphones, right? We have pictures here of someone in a studio, someone, a singer performing live, someone probably doing a radio show or a podcast, and then actually a pianist um, performing live and potentially getting recorded live. Um, all of these, if you ask any sound engineer, what they'll say is that all of these tasks require a different piece of equipment. Um, what I'm interested in uh, personally, uh, professionally, as I said, is a microphone or equipment that actually allows me to hear the voice as it, was, as it might be in the room. Um, for those of us, since this is Voice Foundation, for those of us who um, conduct voice research, um, this is pretty germane, right? 
um, to our to our practice that if I'm recording a, a singer or a speaker and I'm interested in performing some sort of acoustical analysis or spectral analysis of their voice, I likely won't use certain types of microphones. I actually would prefer to use a microphone that we would call, uh, that we would say has a flat response, right? Because, and I would position that microphone a certain distance away from the individual's mouth, uh, the participant's mouth. We use a different type of microphone for voice research than we would for um, a live singing situation or a live or a podcasting situation. So what is the purpose of your recording? We all have varying needs. So I'm never gonna tell anybody what model they should buy. Um, that, that we are, in, at least in the United States, um, we are experiencing some significant supply um, chain issues. So if I tell someone to buy a microphone, the chances are that that microphone, not because I'm special in any way, but that some of these uh, manufacturers or some of these um, stores actually only have a handful of these microphones on hand. Um, so if five people buy this microphone, that might be all of that specific type of microphone that the store can sell. So what model isn't so important? What is important is the, are the specifications for the microphone or for the audio interface or for the um, headphones. I'm gonna talk about chain real quick, um, just so that we understand all these words that I'm throwing at you. So. For, for the single chain, what we're interested in is understanding all the different parts that the sound travels through before it gets to one's ear or computer. So in this situation, we have the singer, he or she is singing into a flat response uh, measurement microphone that is connected with an e uh, XLR cable to an audio interface, which is then connected to a computer via a most likely a USB cable potentially firewire. And then it then the sound, if you're, for example, using um, a uh, the audio streaming platform, um, the sound is then uh, taken from, well, from the internet to the computer, then sent through the audio interface, and then ultimately through the headphones to your ear. So that's an extra little step in the, in the process, potentially. Um, and I should also say that um, because I want to be I want to acknowledge everybody's kind of the, the, the breadth of experience that's represented in Voice Foundation. Um, I should say that a lot of this information about the equipment, if you yourself um, use this type of equipment in your clinic, or at, perhaps you are a voice researcher, this um, is most likely going to be a little bit of um, a foundations, a foundational kind of conversation that you might, so you might already know most of this information. It's not necessarily novel, it's just information that is important for, this, uh, for the purposes of our discussion today. So an audio interface, why, why might we need an audio interface? Well, the audio interface, first of all, for the type of microphone that we're going to be suggesting um, that we use for um, either voice lessons or potentially even therapy, voice therapy, um, we're interested in microphones that are called uh, condenser microphones and not dynamic microphones. These microphones uh, pick up very small pressure variations um, when an individual sings or speaks. And in order to amplify those very small pressure variations, um, we actually need to power the microphone with something called phantom power. So these audio interfaces actually supply power to the microphone. Because we're using, um, we're suggesting XLR microphones, this as opposed to USB microphones, um, in most situations, this audio interface also allows us to both amplify the signal and convert it from analog to digital um, using an XLR cable to connect the audio interface and the microphone. You can also easily adjust gain here, which is not possible with USB microphones. And then uh, the, perhaps the most important thing uh, in comparison between USB microphones and uh, microphones that require an audio interface is that there's a lower signal to noise ratio. So the, no the sound that you hear is less encumbered by the noise that is added to the signal simply by the, the equipment that you're using. Also importantly, um, audio interfaces allow for a larger dynamic range. This is particularly important for singing teachers. 
um, because we, of course, want to be able to hear a wide um, dynamic range. We want to be able to hear very soft singing and very loud singing. Unfortunately, for uh, example, USB microphones, because of the way that they actually process um, amplitude um, or sound pressure level, they actually um, decrease, or rather, they, yeah, they decrease the uh, dynamic range of whatever sound, your signal you're putting through the system, through the microphone. So microphones, this is a big question, right? Which one should I choose? Should I choose just, is it okay to use my internal microphone? Is it okay, should I, you know, maybe invest in a high end, higher end reference microphone, a research grade microphone? Um, is it okay if I just buy a, a bundle? Could my iPhone work? How about the Blue Yeti, right? And I'm gonna try and not make so many jokes about a Blue Yeti right now, but right, this is something that um, is uh, part of our experience as voice uh, teachers and clinicians that we all of a sudden had to switch to virtual teaching or virtual practice. And we all asked what microphone we should get and everybody and their mother said we should buy the Blue Yeti. Well, we can't buy the Blue Yeti anymore. The Blue Yeti in most cases is either very expensive um, or is just not being sold by uh, manufacturers because there are by stores because there aren't any left. Um, which, Can I jump in on that point yeah. for just a second, Josh? Of course. And I, and I, think, um, I, I think there's a point there that we were trying to get around since March. One of the things that we saw from March the 7th on, early on in the pandemic, was a lot of web chatter that was very well intentioned of people who had experience already teaching online, but who were just sharing their anecdotal opinion of this mic sounds great, you should buy it, or this platform works great, you should use, you know, you should use Skype, you should use Zoom. And it was all anecdote and no evidence. And you know, many of us here are scientists, right? And like saying, hey, this mic sounds good to a scientist is like, you know, I mean, it's just not, it's just, it, there's no evidence that that's the case. That's like saying that, you know, that there's, anyway, go ahead, Josh. Of course, and, I, and I'll, now in my video, I have to apologize for my mood lighting. It got very stormy outside, so my whole lighting is totally screwed up now. Um, <laughs> um, in any event, um, so, so yeah, which microphone to choose is not so important. Um, which model to buy is not so important. What is important is what specifications should we be looking for? And as I said, for those of us who are um, kind of more comfortable or more have some background with um, audio recording technology, this um, may or may not be um, old news. Um, ah, and of course, another microphone. So what are we looking for in these specifications? The first thing that we need to look for is the polar pattern. All of these will be online. When you look at a, you know, at Sweetwater or B&H or name your, or Amazon, name your, um, you know, store of choice, your online store of choice, um, all of this information will be listed with the uh, microphone. And if not, um, you can always refer to the um, manual, which is usually something that you can download, the spec sheet, which you can usually download um, from the actual manufacturer. So. When we're looking at polar pattern, we're talking about what kind, where the microphone picks up the sound. So for example, if you look at this, um, this graph here or this chart here, the omnidirectional here is picking up sound all around the microphone, all around the diaphragm. The cardioid microphone would pick up sound to the north, some to the uh, east and the west, but not much behind it, right? So it's what you would call a directional microphone. And in fact, most of these other microphones we would call, we would categorize as directional microphones, which are incredibly useful if you're, say, performing live on stage or perhaps recording an ensemble and you want to pick up um, just one instrument rather than all of the instruments that surround it. For example, this uh, figure eight could be really um, wonderful at picking up the sound coming from an instrument and then also the sound reflected in the room. Um, for the purposes of voice teaching or working with uh, cl uh, clients in the um, clinic, uh, we are suggesting that we look at these, omni we look for omnidirectional microphones. Um, the reason being something that we know in voice research, which is that directional microphones both filter sound um, pretty drastically um, most of the time, or 
they actually uh, suffer from something called the proximity effect, which will actually boost lower frequencies, right? So I might, for example, if I had a cardioid microphone, if I got very close to it, I might actually artificially darken my voice. My voice might sound a little bit warmer. It's the radio announcer effect, right? So if someone moves close, if a radio announcer moves closer to their microphone, all of a sudden their voice sounds pretty boomy. Um, and that's desirable for them, but maybe not so much for us when our clients um, need to make really fine um, adjustments, both uh, to motor habits and also to aspects of their own timbre that might be indicative of function. We also uh, care about the frequency response. This is this filtering idea that I've been talking about. We're interested in microphones that actually don't color the sound. Because if I, for example, use a microphone that boosts lower frequencies and make my sound uh, artificially dark, my voice teacher might actually, or my um, you know, speech, uh, speech therapist might actually um, try to make me make changes depending on their own pedagogy and their own methods. They might actually try and have me make adjustments um, based on what they're hearing. That's actually quite germane to what we do, in fact. Um, it is what we do. We make changes based on what we hear and sometimes what we see. Um, and so, for example, if we look at this frequency response, which is uh, exactly what it looks like, it's just um, like a, a power spectrum that we're used to seeing in uh, Journal of Voice articles, for example. We see frequency on the uh, x-axis and we see sound intensity level on the y-axis, and this is just telling us um, how different frequencies are either attenuated um, or boosted, right? Um, so for example, in this graph of a uh, cardioid microphone, and actually it's a dynamic microphone as well, um, we see that this area above 2000 Hertz, 2000 Hertz um, to about 10,000 Hertz, that this is actually boosted. So this singer might actually, or this speaker might actually sound artificially bright right, compared to what they actually sound like in the room. And I might, as a voice teacher or as a, a voice therapist, I'm not a voice therapist, but if I were, I might make, ask a singer to make adjustments based on what I was hearing, right, which would have been an artificially bright and sound. I also notice that below hertz, there's this attenuation of the sound intensity level. Um, again, we're used to seeing um, power spectra and this is a way for us to understand how a microphone filters the sound that we hear. In terms of the diaphragm or the microphone type, we're more interested, or the diaphragm or the capsule type, what we're more interested in for the purposes of replicating the oral experience of a voice lesson um, is a, what's called a small diaphragm microphone, which is what you see on the right here. Small diaphragm microphones typically um, filter, for example, what, what Nick has, um, and actually what I have right here, um, small diaphragm microphones um, typically filter sound um, less so than large diaphragm microphones, but maybe it's more appropriate to say that what we're looking for is what's called a reference microphone or a measurement microphone that records exactly what's put into it. Um, and most times measurement, mic measurement microphones or reference microphones are these small diaphragm types. We also want to pay attention to the maximum sound pressure level. Obviously, there are certain uh, measurements in, uh, used by speech language pathologists um, that, worry, that, that are concerned with the, um, both the maximum sound pressure level and also, um, well, there are various measurements that actually, or various types of diagnostic measurements that, um, which would, that would be affected if for example, your speaker was too loud for the microphone. Uh, perhaps more um, important to my own experience is that singers like to be loud. Um, and then of course the big question, right? Can I just buy a USB microphone or do I really need to go for the whole shebang and buy a, a microphone that is connected to an audio interface with an, via an XLR cable? And we would suggest that actually that XLR cable or the XLR, the microphone that uses an XLR cable is going to be um, more efficacious for what we're doing. Um, it's going to be more beneficial for our um, practice. Um, and that is because the US, when you use a USB microphone, uh, one of our good friends likes to say that what you're doing is you're buying a decent microphone and a really poor audio interface. Um, and what that does is it decreases the amount of, as I said earlier, it de decreases the um, amount of distance between, uh, or 
sorry, increases the amount of distance between um, the and um, therefore makes it more difficult to record really soft sounds or really loud sounds. Um, everything is actually compressed because um, of the way that it measures intensity. Oftentimes you will also notice that there's more noise in the signal for a USB microphone. Um, now, if again, we do want to say that if there's a, if there are limitations to, um, you know, what you can buy, whether because of supply chain issues or because of one's budget or because you've already spent money on a USB microphone, it's important to just know that these are the limitations of your technology, the limitations of your equipment. And we're not saying go and spend, you know, a thousand US dollars. We're saying, um, you know, there are solutions for every budget. Um, these solutions, I will say for my private clients who are mainly young professionals right now, when they hear me on clean feed right now, um, using Jitsi, um, with a reference microphone, their minds are blown because we're all used to hearing the sound with a pretty severe frequency limitation, frequency range limitation. Um, and when they hear that they can, when they notice rather that they can hear my voice, um, if I do demonstrate during a lesson, um, that they can hear some really um, finer nuances than they could previously hear on other platforms, um, that actually kind of spurs them to invest in this technology too. And I will say from the past um, week or two of working with clients who have some more, um, uh, have improved their technology, their equipment setup, um, those lessons are at the very, it might be a placebo effect, I highly doubt it, but those lessons are both more effective, more enjoyable, and the singer uh, has been making more progress more quickly. Um, and so that's, that's what's important to us, right? Being able to deliver um, better quality um, to our clients, as, as Mara said so eloquently before. Um, in terms of headphones, we have a couple um, issues with, um, that, that we need to solve, right? We have some problems that we need to solve um, and that we can solve pretty easily via headphones. As Nick said, um, clean feed, um, anything that is really actually either low latency um, or um, high fidelity is going to usually not use echo cancellation. And when you don't use echo cancellation, first of all, you impre improve latency. Um, you make the amount of time that it takes from set for sound to travel from your microphone to someone else's ear, you do that amount of time. Um, but also uh, because there is no echo cancellation, um, if you don't have headphones, you hear obviously this, this pretty intense echo and that makes your practice, your, the goal that you set out to do rather difficult to do, rather difficult to accomplish. Unfortunately, um, we can't really measure the frequency response for headphones very easily. The reason why is because, like we can measure the frequency response of headphones, but the way to do that is actually to use a dummy head and the dummy head is actually pretty standardized. Um, and so when you measure that, dummy head, the frequency response using that dummy head. In fact, because my head is different from yours, I have a different amount of hair than you. Um, you know, the, the, the headphones, the ear, the, yeah, or no, no hair at all, as Nick is pointing out. Um, <laughs> the, the headphones will actually, the shape of your head will actually change the frequency response of the headphones because we all have what's called a head related transfer function. All of us um, filter sound differently. As I said, echo cancellation requires us to find a solution or the lack of echo cancellation requires us to find a solution. And of course, most of us have noticed with headphones that oftentimes because we can't hear ourselves in the room, we actually increase um, at the very least the loudness of our voice or the, and, and potentially the amount of effort that it uh, requires to produce that voice. And so I said, sometimes with headphones, we suffer from the Lombard effect. That's that's a half truth, as most of us know. This is not really the Lombard effect because it's not a loud environment. It's just simply what I'm trying to say is that oftentimes when we have something covering our ears, that require that results in us being louder and experiencing vocal fatigue um, more quickly. So the interesting thing is that we can also relatively we can solve that issue relatively easily as well, um, and we can solve that by using what's called open back headphones. So you see, um, for example, these headphones have this mesh here 
this allows me to actually hear myself to varying degrees in the room. If we're talking about performers, that um, potentially allows them to not actually change their own singing. Um, if we're talking about uh, while performing, if we're talking about um, voice teachers or speech language pathologists, well, all of a sudden, if you can hear yourself in the room, you're less likely to actually become fatigued throughout the day. Now, I can't point to actual studies about this, right? Um, so this is purely anecdotal, um, but I think you can see the, how the logical progression um, as to why this might be beneficial. Now, I say surrounding distractions are important here. Some people um, do not actually benefit from being able to hear everything that's going around uh, in, in the room. For example, if one has children, uh, maybe you don't want to hear that while you're working with a client. And so there's a solution for that too, that kind of is a happy middle ground, and that's called semi using semi-open semi -open back headphones. Semi-open back headphones are oftentimes a bit cheaper than open back uh, headphones. Um, but they do allow a little bit of cancellation of the sound around you. As I said, we can tell what the frequency response of a, head, of a pair of headphones uh, is, um, but that's not always so accurate because all of us have uh, individual head-related transfer function, right? That's just me being, I think, too showy, showing off a little too much about that. But we all have individualized hearing and we have, all have individualized um, filters um, that change what we hear that alter what we hear. Typically, we also do wanna look for a greater than 60 decibel signal to noise ratio. And generally, you don't want noise cancellation. Again, that's because, first of all, you're not actually getting what, uh, you're not always using that algorithm, you're not always getting what the singer puts in or the speaker puts into the microphone because you're inherently using a filter. Um, but then also, uh, it's it, most of the time, I believe you're actually going to be using closed back headphones. So that's again, a bit of a non-starter uh, in my opinion. So what do we need? You might ask, can't you just tell me what to buy? And I would say, no, I really can't because I could have told you what to buy in June. And the thing that I recommended to my institution is on back order until October, right? So that the thing that I was like, this is a cheap, reference microphone. Um, this would be great for, for all of these students. It's a nice low cost option. Um, that I cannot get those in my hands until October 10th earliest. And you might say, please, and I'd say, no, I'm sorry. So what do we need here? If you get nothing else from this, these are the specs that you want to look for when you're um, looking into a microphone, an audio interface, and a pair of headphones. I would also say that you can prioritize these, right? For me, as a voice teacher, it's not so important for me to have a high-end research-grade microphone, right? Because as we know from motor learning theory, or as we uh, think we know from motor learning theory, it's more beneficial uh, for the, well, it's, you know, Nick, it's, it's science, right? Science changes, as we know. Um, so what we think we know from motor learning theory is that it's more beneficial for the student to be doing things than for me to be talking at them. Um, and so, for example, if I'm not singing at them or talking at them, it's not so important for me for them to be able to get a really accurate, um, uh, a really accurate uh, audio signal from me, right? Or representation of them. what is important is for me to be able to hear them, right? So I might, for example, if I was using a laggy solution, I could even use an, a USB microphone. If I was using clean feed, I could use a USB microphone forget the audio interface for a little bit and buy myself open back headphones, which will keep me from getting tired and that most likely vocally tired or vocally fatigued. And um, it would allow me to hear my students more accurately, which is important to my practice. On the student's end, maybe they don't have to buy open back headphones right away, right? Maybe they could buy um, an audio interface that's like a, you know, an entry level audio interface and really invest in a reference microphone and then have a pair of headphones, but maybe keep one ear off of the other or off of, or one headphone uh, side off of their ear. And then they can hear themselves in the room, right? And all of a sudden you don't need the open back headphones. Maybe it's a little awkward, right? Um, but that's the, you know, I suppose that's the other price that you pay them. Um, so so there, are, there are kind of solutions. Um, I know that one of my um, clients is also a voice teacher and he and his wife purchased headphones to start. And then 
a month or two months later, they bought an audio interface and a reference microphone. And we just had a wonderful lesson. Um, so, so it's, there are, this is not a prescription. This is a suggestion um, and, a, and information that allows us to, again, work towards best practice that of course evolves. So wrapping it up, please look at all the specs of the tech that you wanna buy. Don't listen to people who say, you know, go buy yourself a Blue Yeti because my grandmother has it and it's amazing and it looks cool. Um, look at the things that are on the, you know, take that, that previous slide, look at the, uh, the, tech, the equipment that you're looking to buy, see if it matches up with that and um, move on from there. Wow, it got dark quickly, my apologies. Um, and an audio interface will almost always result in, a, in better quality recordings and lower latency. The other thing I didn't mention about USB microphones is that we also know if you're using something like Soundjack, that it actually increases the time that it takes for the signal to reach the other person's ear. It actually increases latency to use a USB microphone. So anything that we can do to decrease the amount of time that it takes to get from this microphone to your ear is a really great, uh, great thing for, the, uh, for using Soundtrack or other low latency platforms. But most importantly, I think all of us, like the, the, the three of us and, and, and Voice Foundation, um, if I could speak for Voice Foundation right now, would like you to know that right now it's possible to have high fidelity audio or voice lessons or um, I'm sorry, voice lessons or voice therapy for free. Clean feed is free. If you want to have the, op the option to record or to change audio settings, you could pay 22, 22 US dollars a month. Um, but right now, if you wanted to, you could use clean feed for free, Jitsi for free, throw away your Zoom <laughs> subscription and have really high fidelity um, voice experiences, voice work um, for free. And then, of course, all tech decisions have to be considered with your goals, right? Not one microphone and, you know, it's not going to fit all of your different needs. Um, just like a pan, you know, one, uh, uh, good Lord, I can't think right now. The, um, just like one nonstick skillet would not fulfill all of my cooking needs. Thank you so much. And as I said, up there, uh, top right, um, or wherever I am on your screen, top right of this slide um, is that QR code that takes you to a website that has a bunch of different examples so that you can listen with high fidelity um, to all of these different musical examples. Great. What about uh, the difference between wired and wireless headphones? You want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So, so yeah, sure. So. Um, let's even backtrack further with clean feed. One of the things we know that we've been noticing is that um, the echo, like an echo typically occurs when we have, um, what is it, either two ring or two ring jacks or, uh, is that correct, Nick? Two ring jacks or... Um, we want to avoid the third ring with the built-in inline mic. Right. Um, or um, earbuds. I've noticed that, right, with earbuds, um, you will typically experience a, a, an echo with a clean feed. Like that, like Alan yep. has this right is there. My, these are my Apple earbuds, an older pair. Right. But they have three rings on them. Right. So, so we do want over-the-ear headphones um, for clean feed. Um, and then for low latency platforms, uh, we also do not want um, uh, wireless. Why, yeah, Bluetooth or, or otherwise wireless. Latency. Exactly. So um, we, yes. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, I mean. Nope, no. exactly. Um, That's it. Sandy, to your question ab about any of these platforms being HIPAA approved, I cannot speak to that one way or the other. I don't think any of us could. One of the things that I, I did want to say, you know, just from a from a, a speech language pathologist perspective, uh, particularly I know a, a lot of my colleagues who work in hospitals, they are locked in to a particular telehealth platform. Uh, my colleagues at the University of Mississippi Medical Center that I work with, they're locked in. They don't have, when they were doing telemedicine, they didn't have an option to even uh, explore any of these other platforms because the medical center told them this is what we are approving you to use. And so, I mean, I, it, 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 it's, I, and I can't speak to any HIPAA 
um, restrictions if you run a private practice uh, it, that, that, that HIPAA would come into play because we're voice teachers first and foremost and voice teaching is of course the wild wild west of, of regulations um, so uh, I can't speak to that I'm sorry so I suppose at this point we could we'd be happy to take questions about this um, uh, Mara if you want to Yes. Or, or Alan, if you, either of you want to kind of direct that. Uh, I would like to, to make a question to you all. Uh, first of all, I want to say that you did a wonderful job. This is precious information, so well summarized, right to the point. This is the best of Nat's tradition to pick up the best available information to summarize to put it in a very clear presentation so if you don't want to learn it's completely your fault but the information is there so i would like to congratulate you because this is a wonderful information i think that we learn a lot during this pandemic time it's a hard way of learning, but we learn a lot. Do you think that when you come back, because I do believe we are going to come back to a sort of normal situation, what's going to be changed in the way we teach or we deliver therapy? After all this attention, the Zoom attention, we are more nonverbal oriented because we want to look at the other eyes, we see the reaction, we are getting more knowledge, our brain is working with a different framework. What are the changes? What are the changes you have seen currently and that you estimate we are going to see later on? I mean, I'll start go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just a, a big picture kind of view of that I think is that um, we focused uh, from about March till oh say May till to go to kind of school was out, all right. In my opinion, uh, we focused very visually. I mean, we were handicapped a little bit by the audio. Okay, so. And many of us teach. We look at what we we hear, but we see. We identify certain problems in lessons or in therapy, but you know, visually. So we can do pretty well. And of course, we knew what our students sounded like before our clients, before we had to move into this mode. So we had that reference point. Uh, I think now that we better understand that we kind of, uh, for most of our purposes, that we have to kind of flip that. And we really want the better audio and uh, so it's going to then, now that we have some of these solutions determined, we're now going to kind of go back and flip our, our thoughts back to audio orally. We're going to be able to listen better. We're going to be able to hear. We're going to be less dependent on the visual. And so that's going to be a different paradigm. Also, of course, until things do get back to some sense of uh, whatever the normal is, um we're going to continue in this you know in this pattern and we're going to have new clients come to us and they're going to enter this situation you know like we've done today you know this will be their mode of entry and while some of our friends have been doing telemedicine and teleteaching and online teaching for years okay and they've worked it out for themselves and how it works for them most people have not. Um, so I think when we, as we move back, I think one, we'll have a, a, uh, a membership, you know, a global kind of membership in the voice profession that yeah. certainly has upped their game technologically and their skill set, whether they were, you know, drug kicking and screaming into it because they had to because of this, or whether they were somebody who was, you know, all excited about it. You know, I'll tag on to that. I think one of the exciting things that that we're seeing, I, I hope that will come out of this, is uh, being an academician and in the academy, I think we've done, generally speaking, 
a pretty poor job of putting technology in our students' hands. Mm-hmm. We like like in the voice profession, we had no problem with telling our students, "Well, you got to pay eight hundred dollars to get good headshots, or you got to pay eight hundred dollars in audition fees, or whatever." But as soon as we said, "Hey, but you know what? You really ought to spend three hundred bucks on some audio equipment," it, it, it kind of became this defensive thing, and I, I think we're going to see that change, and I think it's exciting because I think if we can get tech in the students hands that will open up their world and while i don't think everybody will just all of a sudden become a tech nerd like i don't think that's where we're headed that's just not everybody's personality just like everybody not every single singing teacher is going to really end up like josh and i and really into voice acoustics that's just not going to happen um but i think as we get technology into students hands they're going to start to teach us about the technology and for example one of the really complex things when I was talking about Soundjack is the fact that if you're doing a remote connection on Soundjack you really need to customize your router and set your router admin settings to do something called port forwarding which sounds very complex and scary when I've said this to my students they go oh yeah port forwarding what you have to do to play online gaming because if they play Fortnite or they play World of Warcraft, they already port forward their modem to the to World of Warcraft server, so it's second nature to them. Mm-hmm. Whereas to a maybe a 50-year-old voice teacher, they're like, I have to do what now? But to a 20-year-old, they're like, yeah, sure, port forwarding, right. How else would I play Fortnite? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think ultimately it brings us closer, right? I mean, yeah. I have... I was so hesitant i will i will admit and i've actually already admitted it um on nick's uh podcast um i uh vocal fry podcast um (laughs) i was so hesitant for the longest time to do online lessons because i had an understanding that the audio quality would be greatly diminished um and i would if a student begged me to do it i would do it like it before an audition or something right um, and now I have no qualms about that because objectively we can see um, that we have platforms that give us really high fidelity audio streaming. You know? mm-hmm. And in uh, that regard, I think it's going to change our geography limitations. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. I have one more question. Uh, if you ask a student, a client, a patient to record something and to send you the audios, which are the directions you give this person? How should he or she record via iPhone? In which way? And how to send? Can it send to WhatsApp? Is it better to send via we transfer email? What are the directions in general? I personally think that anything that we say is probably going to be anecdotal. Um, but that being said, I think that um, in terms of sharing, uh, Google Drive or um, Dropbox or any kind of cloud storage is going to probably be pretty efficient. Um, obviously, that's limited based on um, your means or what institution you're with, if you're with an institution. Um, so, so in terms of storage, that, that is a pretty um, uh, ex- you know, efficient way of doing that. In terms of recording, um, of course, with you know that's an asynchronous solution. So if you were to use something like Zoom um, that was laggy, but um, and also has some limited um, audio fidelity, let's say like for example, an individual is in an area where um, internet access is less, is lower, right? Or there is less internet access for that individual. Um, you know, a high fidelity audio streaming platform might not be um, quite as available. Right? So they might have to use something like Zoom. In that situation, you could augment your practice by not just having your synchronous um, uh, appointment right? or, or lesson or, 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 or whatnot um, with Zoom, but you could also have them record, which I think is where your question comes from, Mara. Yes. Um, you can have them record on some device and then upload it to some sort of cloud storage system. Um, in that case, it's really a matter of what their means, what they have. Of course, if you buy a microphone and an audio interface um, and have a camera or something that could work very well. 
but an iPhone will also work better than um, if you were to use that iPhone for a synchronous instruction or a synchronous appointment, right? So you could use your iPhone or your Android phone, record the, the have the student or client record themselves um, and then upload that. And that would be a better quality recording than say using Zoom. Yeah, I would say that's uh, where something like uh, the app Marco Polo comes in as a good solution for kind of this asynchronous, it's a free app. You can actually record a video, you know, with the audio. Uh, and it's, you know, it's like we chat, but it's video. And so you just record it and it notifies the person you're sending it to and they can listen to it and respond back. I did that quite a bit with some of my students uh, this last spring where they were practicing between our lessons or I was working with foreign language diction with them, any number of things. I just had them, rather than wait till their next lesson, I said, just record it, send me a Marco Polo, I'll respond back to it with what I think. Great. Nick, did you have something to add there? No, that was great. I was sorry. I was typing in the chat. No, I will say was... one of the things you asked tomorrow was the. I'm sorry, Alan. I was just going to say, Deborah asked, what platform would you recommend to record, for example, part of a session and then show back to a patient in the same session? Can I go real back, real quickly back to something Mara asked, just so I'm clear? Because I, I know in the US, WhatsApp isn't something that we use as um, frequently as um, other right. countries. Um, and so I understand that that is part of, of people's practice pretty frequently. I don't know about their compression algorithms, though, so I can't say for certain. I would assume that it would be less effective than um, other solutions where you can upload the file to the cloud. Um, but that I, I do just because I know that that's used pretty frequently mm. in other countries. Yes. Uh, in terms of Deborah's question, which was what platform would you recommend to record and then part of a session and then and then play that recording back f for a client. Um, if you can record on clean feed, if you have the pro version. So whoever the subscriber is to clean feed, you can record that session or part of the session and then you could download that file and put it in a Dropbox or a Google Drive or whatever and share it with the client. That would be my recommendation. Um, in fact, I just did a voice lesson last week or whatever it was, and that's that's how we did that. Um, now that I have the pro version of Clean Feed, that's so. But in, in order to do that with Clean Feed, you have to have the pro version. There are some other ways that you could do that. Um, uh, is Sandy had mentioned a program called Loopback. Loopback is a very powerful audio routing program which can send audio internally of your computer to other programs. So for example, you could be on a Zoom call and you could have Zoom's audio send to something like Audacity or GarageBand or something else that would record for you, uh, and then you could share that too. Um, but CleanFeed, if you have the pro version, the subscription version, it does have a built-in recorder that is very, very, very high quality. One, one question that we've been asked quite frequently, and, and it may be a little bit... Um, a function, a little bit of a function of having used Zoom for so long, um, is can one record um, video um, and audio, or is there something that one can use to record video? Um, and and I think that's probably particularly important for um, those who are in voice clinics, uh, because there are certain um, visual cues that one can pay attention to, perhaps even more so than in voice lessons. Um, depending on the diagnosis, um, so I was and I was just looking at Jitsi. Um, so Jitsi, what they suggest is that you actually stream from Jitsi to YouTube, and then from Z YouTube it can be uh, a private recording. You can actually send that to your client. Again, streaming would be a little bit more data intensive, but that seems to be a pretty decent solution. Or rather, I would think that would be a rather decent solution. I've never tested it. I'm going to uh, put a couple of links into the uh, chat. One is to the NATS 
uh, web page, but another one is to our YouTube channel because tomorrow um, we're going to have a a special session with some of the uh, researchers who have been doing the uh, research at the University of Colorado on aerosol uh, spread uh, and singing, and uh, that session is at five o'clock Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow, and it will just be right on our YouTube channel, so it'll be uh, broadcast live on there. Uh, and I think that'll uh, be, if you've been following some of that research, uh, it might be of interest to, we're gonna try to drill down into just the voice specific aspects of the research that they're doing. And then on Wednesday, we have another, uh, Nat, we have a Nats chat and Kari Reagan, who many of you have met at, at Voice Foundation before, uh, is gonna be leading a conversation with both some voice teachers and some singers who have had COVID and are either recovering or have recovered and to talk with teachers and others who attend about working with singers. Uh, and one, one of them also is an SLP who's gonna be on as a panelist. So you might find some of that uh, interesting as well as, as how we're going to kind of be moving into uh, working, you know, with singers uh, having recovered, or teachers themselves who have had COVID, uh, working on recovery and how they're going to get back to teaching uh, this year. So I think those those are some things you might be interested in. So I just put those links up there for uh, for you to use. So if we do not have any more thing right now. I know you are all available to all of us, which is great. You are very generous. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I took many notes because my notebook is a real notebook, old fashioned. And uh, it was a great, great session. Highly interesting. I'm sure we are all going to reflect in order to improve to power up our practice. Please, Dr. Henderson, send our best greetings to all Nat's team. We do appreciate this partnership. Dr. Glasner, Dr. Perna, thank you so much for being so kind and so generous. Maria, dear, you know you live in my heart and in all Brazilians' heart. Thank you so much for doing this and send our best greetings to the office and our very, very special hug, virtual hug to Professor Setloff. We are all going to meet June 2 to 6 for the 50th anniversary of the Voice Foundation Symposium in Philadelphia. And One way for, or another. Yes, and for Brazilians, tomorrow 6 p.m. Brazil time we are going to have a comment session on the Vice Foundation Brazilian chapter with Thais Vaiano and Elizabeth Amin they are both going to comment this session and we are going to summarize the data thank you so much enjoy the end of the Sunday thank you we have Brazil we have Chile we have United States and we have Mexico in the skull. I think, Maria, we did it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for having so us. Much. Thank you, Alan. And Ecuador, too. And oh, that's cool. Anna Paceri, gracias, por favor. Te pido disculpas. Ecuador, Mexico, Brazil, United States. This is great. This is and Peru and we all yes, Patricia Fuertes. We have Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, Brazil, and United States. This is great, Maria. Is the voice from the and Chile and Chile? Of course, Marco Guzman is with us. The Voice Foundation all over the world, outreach movement, and Nats and the Voice Foundation. This is great. One, you yeah. one quick. Uh, comment. I um, saw this original um, presentation during the Nats uh, virtual meeting this year, and I was really impressed with it. And I thought that this is information that we really all need, and it's it's totally amazing. But I had to watch it twice 
<laughs> because there's just so much that my brain it, it couldn't take it all in. So little by little, I'm starting to gather what I need to do. But I, I will be, we did record this, so it will be available and I will send that out to the chapters and eventually uh, just have it all on our website, okay? Okay. Oh, thank you all. So and I'm closing out now. Have a great week, uh, end of the weekend. <laughs> okay. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, buddy. Yeah, Okay. And.